Hi everyone, thanks for watching Lori Wired, and in this video we're going to be deconstructing the info.plist within iOS applications. Now, plist stands for property list, and the info.plist is a special kind of property list that contains the main metadata and configuration data inside of iOS applications. So this is really important if you're trying to reverse engineer or do some security analysis on an iOS application, and it's probably kind of the main starting point that you'll do if you're trying to dig into an application. So let's get right into it and let's see what they look like. Now, we're going to take a look at a couple examples, so let's get into our first one. I'm going to be looking at the Filza File Manager, which is an application that is commonly installed on jailbroken devices. And I have my IPA file right here. And remember, this is the main application type for iOS applications. And I've already extracted the contents. And I have another video on how to extract all the contents and go through and find the entry point of iOS applications if you're not sure. But I already have my folder here, so let's get into it and let's find our info.plist. So let's go into our application bundle. And remember, there are a lot of different plists inside of here, but we are looking for info.plist specifically. And you'll just kind of have to remember this name because it's always going to be named this inside of the application bundle. So I have my info.plist right here. And let's open it up and let's just take a look at what are the contents of this. I'm going to open this in Notepad++, and you'll notice that this looks like kind of a ton of junk bytes, but that's because property lists come in two formats. So the first is going to be an XML property list, which if you open that up in Notepad++, you're going to see a nice pretty XML file. But if you open up a binary property list in just regular Notepad or anything, it's going to look like a lot of junk, and you see some keywords in here, but it's not super helpful. Now you can recognize a binary property list, obviously because of the junk bytes inside of here, but also because of the BP list header at the top, which just stands for binary property list. Now, if you're running on Mac and you open up a binary property list, it automatically decodes it for you. But if you're running on like Linux or Windows or any other operating system, you just have to perform a little bit of manual decoding, which is easy to do. And there's a lot of libraries for it in Python or Java or probably the language of your choice. So let's write a quick Python script and let's do some manual decoding of this binary property list. I'm going to use the plist lib, which is just a library inside of Python. And let's open up a terminal and let's open up some Python. So let's start writing our quick Python script. So I'm going to open up my Python terminal. And first of all, I'm going to import the plist library into my program. I'm going to import plist lib. And I'm also going to do some magic with JSON to decode and prettify the JSON object that we get. So I'm going to import that library as well. And I'm currently in the directory of my application bundle. So all I need to do is just open this file and then decode the plist. So I'm going to do with open my info.plist. And then we're going to read the bytes. And I'm going to do as file pointer. And I'm going to store that plist into a variable so that we can decode it later. So I'm going to do plist data equals plist lib dot, and then it's going to take the file pointer as an argument to the function. So let's do dot load, and then I have my file pointer right here. And now all of that data is just stored inside of plist data. So if I want to do this, I can print plist data simply to the console. And we have the plain text for it now, but it's in a really terrible format and there is no spacing inside of this. So you could take this and put this inside like Notepad++ or something and then use the JS tool, for example, to prettify this. Or you can optionally do this in Python directly as well. And I am going to do that. So I'm going to print once again, and then I'm going to do JSON dot dump string, and then it's going to take my plist data, and I'm going to do indent equals four. We'll just do that. And let's see if that gives us a nice, pretty output to work with. Looks like I've got a syntax error. I, I typed index instead of indent. That's OK. We will fix that. Indent. 
And there we go. Now we have a nice looking property list that we can actually read. So I'm gonna go to the top here and then let's just throw this into something like Notepad++. I'm gonna grab all of my plist data. Pretty long. And we'll put that in Notepad++ instead of the binary format. So this is gonna be a lot nicer to read. And if we want to, we can even set the language to be JSON since that's what it is. So now remember, we have two kinds of plists, the XML and then the JSON type, which we actually decoded, which is the binary property list, but we can put it in a JSON format. So now once we actually have the property list open, you're going to see all of these different key value pairs inside of this. And remember, these are all the configurations for this particular application. Now, what I mean by key value, we have key and then value and then key and then value and then so on inside of this entire file right here. Now, once we actually have our property list open, we can take a look at the values that are of interest to us. One such value might be the CF bundle display name. This is gonna be the name that's displayed on the home screen for this application, which is just gonna be Filza in this case. Another one of absolute interest to us is gonna be the CF bundle executable. And this is naming a Maco that is inside of this application bundle. That's gonna be the entry point to the application as well as contain all of the associated executable code for this application bundle. Now you might notice that a lot of the keywords in here are prefixed with CF or NS. Now these just mean that they're uh, APIs, methods, classes, or constants that are part of the main framework for the iOS operating system. So CF stands for core foundation and NS stands for next step. Let's move on inside this property list and let's find some points of interest that might be helpful for some dynamic analysis. So if you're trying to analyze this application by running it and seeing what happens. So I'm gonna find the app transport. Let's search that. Transport security. Now this is a really important security configuration for network traffic. And this does a lot of different stuff, but mainly it disables the ability to use clear text traffic. So if you're trying to analyze this application, there might be a lot of clear text plain HTTP traffic that you can simply connect Burp Suite to or something else and be able to listen to any of the traffic on this application without having to worry about certificates at all. So that's really important if you're trying to do some dynamic analysis and see what kind of network traffic this application performs. Moving on to some hardware and device requirements for being able to run this application, we can see we have the minimum operating system version is going to be 7.0. And we should have some hardware requirements and operating system requirements. This is only going to run on iPhone OS, so it's not going to run on Mac OS, for example. And then if we keep going through, let's see if we have any other data that might be relevant for some dynamic analysis. Let's see, we have required device capabilities. There can be a lot of different values inside of here, but this one in particular is requiring it to run on ARMv7. Other requirements might be making sure it has a camera or something else like that. It's making sure that the device is physically capable of running this application. So those are some of the important tags that you might want to take note of for dynamic analysis. Let's move on to some different ones that are related to static analysis. Now let's see, let's go up and I'm gonna pick out something that looks important. Okay, this is a very important kind of tag. Now if you notice we have this and then this usage description. Now this is saying different capabilities that the application is going to request. And then the corresponding value is going to be the text or the string that gets printed to the user when this application is trying to request those permissions. So this is trying to request access to the photo library, and then it's gonna display to save photos and videos to photo library, which is the justification for why this application is saying it wants access to your photo library. And then it's up to the user, do they want to accept or do they want to decline this request? This is going to be really important for malware analysis in particular, if you're trying to find the potential capabilities of this application. Now let's move on to another part of this application. Let's see. 
Let's look at CF bundle URL types. Now this is naming different custom URL schemes that are able to trigger this application. Now this is important since it enables communication between different applications on the iOS device and it's registering what URL can be used to trigger this particular application. That means that with the CF bundle URL scheme set to Filza, if another application did something like Filza and then linked to some different part inside of this application, the operating system would actually trigger this application to run and deep link it to whatever part that this URL is actually trying to point to. So let me get rid of this. Now, one interesting thing to note is that there is actually a vulnerability with custom URL schemes, and this is part of the reason that they switched to using universal links instead. The vulnerability is that any application could register any custom URL scheme. So if that application, let's say it's a malicious application, is installed on the device and it's trying to register Filza as a custom URL scheme, and then another application is trying to trigger Filza file manager, they're actually going to trigger the malicious application that is pretending to be Filza based off of that custom URL scheme. So now if you use universal links, it does a lot more verification on the server side to make sure that it's actually triggering the right application. Now let's take a look at another example just to make sure that you've got your head around the info.plist and all of the points of interest inside of it. So I'm going to open up a malware example and we'll go inside of our payload, inside of our application bundle. This is gonna be named photograph demo. And here is our info.plist special file. So I'm gonna open this up and let's see if it's a binary plist or an XML plist. And it looks like it is indeed an XML property list. So we can go ahead and just read all of the code inside of here, plain text. And then again, we have our key value pairs, just like we did in our binary property list, but in XML format instead of JSON. Again, we have our CF bundle name, which is going to be set to photograph demo. And then we should have our CF bundle executable inside of here. Yes, we do, which is also set to photograph demo. So that means there's going to be a Maco named photograph demo, which is going to be the entry point and contain all of the executable code. And again, we have our required device capabilities, which we are again requiring ARM v7 for this application to be able to run, and a minimum operating system version of 10.0. And one other interesting thing to note for static analysis would be the CF bundle identifier. Now this is going to be a unique identifier for every single application. This is the one for this particular application and then the Filza file manager will have its own unique identifier as well from the CF bundle identifier tag. Let's just go through our info.plist and let's see if there's anything interesting inside of here. It's actually pretty short, so there's not too much to look at. I think the only main thing of interest is this NS contacts usage description. Now remember, anything that ends in usage description is the application trying to request a permission to be able to access any sensitive user data, such as photos or contacts or anything like that. This one in particular is trying to access the user's contacts and it's giving this justification string as to why it wants to access those contacts. So this is the corresponding string that they're using as the justification for why they need access to the context. So this looks like it's in Korean. I do not speak Korean, so I will use Google Translate. Let's just do Korean to English and enter in and see what our justification is. So it's saying context permission is required. Seems legit. I would definitely give permission if they just said it's required. Okay. Now there's a lot of other metadata inside of the info.plist and you can find any values that are of interest to you, but this covers a lot of the points of interest for reverse engineering as well as performing security analysis on an application. So thanks so much for watching Lori Wired everyone. In this video we covered the info.plist inside of iOS applications. We saw how there could be both XML or binary property lists and we had to perform an extra step for decoding binary property lists. We also looked at a lot of the different key value pairs inside of the info.plist and found the main executable as well as different network security settings, custom URL schemes, and a lot of different other metadata that's of interest. So thanks so much for watching Lori Wired everyone and I'll catch you in the next video.